So we are here in Judges chapter number 17. And look at verse 7 where the Bible reads, and it says, And there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim to the house of Micah as he journeyed. And Micah said unto him, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said unto him, Dwell with me, and be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year, and a suit of apparel, and thy victuals. So the Levite went in, and the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the, man, and the young man was unto him as one of his sons. And Mike, Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man be, became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Then, Mi, then said Micah, Now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. And what's going on in the story, if you just read what was read earlier, that uh, this is after the judges, I believe, or there's no judge reigning, so every man's doing that which is right in their own eyes. And what ends up happening is this man, Micah, ends up taking his mom's 1,100 shekels of silver. He steals it and then eventually gives it back. And then for some weird reason, they start making, they get an idolatry and then they make an idol out of, uh, they just end up making an idol. And then we get into a story, part of the story where there's a Levite or a man from Bethlehem, Judah, and he's trying to find just somewhere to stay. And he ends up meeting with Micah. Micah, he ends up uh, seeing him. And then when he gets to Micah's house, Micah says, hey, please dwell with me. And I'm going to give you all this, you know, I'll give you this money, suit of apparel, and I'll take care of you with food and things like that. So the Levite says, yeah, I'll dwell with you. He ends up staying with Micah. And Micah says this. He says in verse 13, then said Micah, now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. And that's where I get the title of my message from for t the sermon today is called this, Christian Lucky Charms. Christian Lucky Charms. What do I mean by a lucky charm? Well, you've heard of a lucky charm. It's something that, it's an object or an item that th people think brings good luck to them. And you know, the dictionary definition of that is something worn about a person to ward off evil or ensure good fortune. And oftentimes people say, you know, one of the items would be like an amulet. That's people see that as something to ward off evil spirits. Well, I can think of a lot of lucky charms because I remember as a kid, this is something that I grew up in with, grew up with in elementary school. And we had a lot of, I remember during St. Patrick's Day, there, they had a lot of uh, like things that you would, activities you would do with that would symbolize good luck. So I'm just going to go over a few quick things that maybe will ring a bell to you that you may, have, you may think of when you think of lucky charms. Fuzzy dice. Often people who gamble and who roll dice, they'll have a set of fuzzy dice that, from my understanding, they would touch the fuzzy dice and then they'll hopefully roll that lucky number seven and win, you know, a million dollars. Then people also have lucky coins where they think if they throw this coin inside of water, you know, inside like a fountain or something, then that's going to bring them good fortune or good luck. Now, a lot of people believe in numerology. They, they think that the number seven is just this lucky number. That's why you have all these people who go to casinos. They're like, I just want that lucky number seven. Then I didn't know this, but people think that acorns bring good luck. That's something that was actually new to me. Another thing are dream catchers. That's something that a lot of uh, Native Americans have where they think that, well, if I put a dream catcher up, it's going to make me have sweet dreams. And then this is one that I'm really familiar with is rabbit's foot. So I don't know if someone's familiar with that. That's probably a more common one that if you have a rabbit's foot and you carry it around, it's going to bring good luck to you. Or horseshoes, that kind of has the same uh, effect that it's going to have, if you have a horseshoe with you, then that's going to bring good luck. And probably the most famous one is if you find a four-leaf clo clover, and that's the one that's just going to bring you this mountain of good luck. And I remember as a kid, I ended up finding a four-leaf clo clover, and I don't know what happened to it to this day, because it doesn't matter. Now, the reason I'm bringing all those things up is this, is that they're what when someone's trusting in a lucky charm, or trusting in something that brings good luck, that's someone who's being superstitious, meaning that they think that there's some, you know, this hidden meaning or hidden power behind some object or something. And 
that's at best for people who may be saved that get caught up in that. Now, other people who believe that you should have these objects or lucky charms, a lot of it just comes from paganism, that they think, well, if I have this rabbit foot, then it's going to ward off this bad spirit or this evil spirit. A lot of that just comes simply from paganism. But why is the title of my sermon, Christian Lucky Charms? Well, there are a lot of lucky charms that Christians think that they can have or that they're, they can have around them that's going to bring them good fortune. Now, we see in this passage, I'm going to read it again in Judges chapter number 17, Verse 13, it says, Then said Micah, Now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. So if you read that, what is Micah saying? He's saying, well, God's going to bless me now that I have a Levite with me, thinking that if he has the right person around him, then he's going to get God's blessing on his life. Well, that's not necessarily true. Just because you're around a saved person or just because you're around a person who's serving God doesn't automatically mean that you're going to get or inherit those blessings from that person. That's something that happens on an individual basis, and we're going to see that from some passages tonight. And that brings me to my first point is this, is just, you know, the first Christian lucky charm is just being around the right person. Well, just because you're around another Christian or around a saved believer doesn't just ensure God's blessings on your life. Now, I am going to give a disclaimer on that, is that yeah, if you go to a good church, a good soul winning church, there are going to be blessings on your life. If you go out soul winning and you're a silent partner, you don't even say a word out there when you're out soul winning. Yeah, God's going to bless you for your effort. God's going to bless you for the work you're doing. And I believe you even get a lot of the same rewards as someone who is doing the talking. You know, or if you, you're donating to some missionary that's serving God in another country that you can't go to, you know, there, there are blessings that come from that. But just being around a Christian or another believer doesn't just ensure that God's going to bless your life fully. And I think Micah had that idea because he says, Now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. So he has that idea that God's going to bless him because he's around the right person. But if you read early on the story, what did Micah do? I mean, he stole from his, his mom. Not only that, he ended up making idols. So he was doing a lot of wicked things. And a lot of people have that idea, well, if I'm around the right person, then God's going to bless my life no matter what. And that's why I think the idea that Micah had. Now, this often comes out soul winning. Whenever you go soul winning, people will say this. You'll, you'll, go, you'll, go, you'll ask someone if they know for sure that they're going to heaven when they die. And what does that person tell you? They say, yeah, I know I'm going to heaven because I go to church. Now, sometimes they just don't understand the question you're asking. But other times, I believe people actually mean that. Well, because I go to this church... Therefore, God's going to bless my life. Because I'm around these believers, therefore, God's going to bless my life. That's not true. Just because you go to church, God's not going to bless your life in, in that sense. Just because you're sitting there, you go day in, especially if it's a bad church. But that's not going to get you saved either. And that's the, the connotation that a lot of people like to bring that up in is that, well, because I go to church, therefore, I'm going to heaven. Well, that's not true, my friend. Not only that, you'll hear this more often than not when you're talking to someone. So when you ask them, hey, are you 100 percent sure you're going to heaven? They'll say, oh, yeah, I know I'm going. My father is a minister. My dad, you know, is a pastor. My mom works in the church. Well, what these people have, the, the idea they have is that, well, because my family member is serving in a church in such capacity, therefore, this is going to ensure my salvation. Well, that's not true either. Just because your family member does something in a church, whether it's a pastor, deacon, uh, they work in a nursery, whatever, doesn't mean that that automatically gets you into heaven. And people have that wrong idea. Now, what I want you to do is turn to Ezekiel chapter number 18, Ezekiel 18. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read a verse from Deuteronomy. Because we need to understand that salvation, and I think we all understand that, that's something that's on an individual basis. Everyone gets saved on their own. I can't get my dad saved or my mom saved or my brother and sister saved. You know, I can get them saved in the sense I can present them the gospel, but I can't be the one that I'm not getting saved for them. You know, that's not a decision they have to make on their own. But bringing this up, because what I'm saying is that someone's righteousness doesn't automatically, if someone is righteous in your life, doesn't mean that their righteousness is imputed onto you. And the same goes vice versa. If someone sins, then that, or your parents sin, or one of your family members sins, then that doesn't automatically mean that you're, you're going to be punished for those sins. Now, I would say oftentimes with like a family, you know, say you have a parent that's doing a lot of wicked stuff, maybe they're an alcoholic, then because they're, they're, they have children other than them, if God judges that person, then that person, the, the children get caught in the crossfire, so they may end up 
being hurt or damaged by what their parents are doing, but ultimately the kid is not getting punished for their parents' sin. Now it says in Deuteronomy 24, 16, the father shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. So the Bible's clear for sin, and like I said, this is the opposite of what I'm trying to explain, but for someone sinning, like if a parent sins, then the child is not punished for that parent's sin, and vice versa, the son is not parent, or the, the child's not parent punished for the parent's sin, and then the ch parent is not punished for the child's sin. So everyone's put to death for their own sin. Now I have you in Ezekiel chapter number 18, look at verse 5, it says this, But if a man be just, and do that which is lawful and right, and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath come near to a menstruous woman, and hath not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, hath covered the naked with a garment. He that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man. It says in verse 9, hath walked in my statues and hath kept my judgments to deal truly. He is just, he shall live, saith the Lord God. So what's going on? You have a man, this man's doing what's right in God's eyes. He's keeping God's commandments. He's serving God. He's doing that, which is, as the Bible says in verse 5, lawful and right. Well, what God, the Bible's saying in verse nine that the guy's gonna live because if you read this chapter it talks about people dying for their sins and then people living when they're doing what's right they die when they're doing what's wrong and then they live when they're doing what's right well god's saying that if this guy is doing what's right then he's gonna live now it says in verse 10 if he begat a son that is a robber a shedder of blood and that doeth the like to any of these things and that doeth not any of those duties, but even hath eaten upon the mountains and defiled his neighbor's wife, hath oppressed the poor and needy, hath spoiled by violence, hath not restored the pledge, and hath lifted up his eyes to idols, hath committed abomination, hath given forth upon usury, and hath taken increase. Shall he then live? He shall not live. He hath done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. So what we see here is that if that same guy who's doing what's righteous, he ends up having a son, and that son ends up becoming a wicked son. He does a lot of wicked things, as the Bible says, then God will punish that son. He's going to punish him. He's, the Bible says his, he's going to die, and his blood is going to be upon him. Now in verse 14 it says this, Now lo, if he beget a son, that seeth all his father's sins, which he hath done, and considereth, and doeth not such like, that hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, hath not defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath oppressed any, hath not withholden the pledge, neither hath spoiled by violence, but hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment, that hath taken off his hand from the poor, that hath not received usury nor increase, hath executed my judgments, hath walked in my statutes, he shall not die for the iniquity of his father, he shall surely live. So the Bible says pretty much the guy's grandson. So you have a guy who is doing what's right, he has a son that's doing bad, then the the grandfather, I guess we'll just call him that, he was doing what's right, God's gonna let him live, he's not gonna punish him. He has a son that's doing wrong. He's going to punish a son. That same one that was doing wrong, he has another son. And he says, hey, I'm not going to follow after my dad's footsteps. I'm going to do that which, which is right. Then it says that he's not going to die in his father's iniquity. He shall surely live. Now it says in verse 18, As for his father, because he hath cruelly oppressed, spoiled his brother by violence, and did that which is not good among his people, lo, even he shall die in his, in his iniquity. So the Bible's saying that that guy's father who wasn't doing what's right is going to be punished by God. Now in verse 19 is what I want to focus on because I just want to give you all of that in context, where it says, Yet ye say, Why? Doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father? When the son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept 
all my statues and have done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So it's all summed up in this, is that the son's not going to bear the iniquity of the father, neither is the father going to bear the iniquity of the son. And it says the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. So your righteousness is on you. And then it says the wickedness shall be of the wicked shall be upon him, meaning that your wickedness, if you commit wickedness, it's going to be on you, meaning they don't overlap and they don't. Uh, if your parent is doing what's right, that doesn't automatically mean that you're going to get blessed by that. God's going to punish you for your un own sins and then vice versa. If your parent is righteous and you're doing or if you're doing righteousness or you're doing what's right, God's not going to say, well, because this person's born in this family, therefore their parents going to get all these blessings. It doesn't work that way. You get you're going to get punished when you do wrong and you're going to get blessed when you do right. And just because you're around the right person doesn't automatically mean that you're going to get God's blessing on your life. And that's the point I'm getting at is that if you're righteous or sorry, if you're just hanging around some righteous person and you're living a wicked life, God's going to punish you and that person's righteousness is not going to be imputed onto you. That person's righteousness is not going to cover any of your sins and God's going to punish you for the sins you're doing. Now, go with me to Romans chapter number 9. Romans chapter number 9. And the same thing goes with salvation. Is that with salvation, for instance, Paul, he wanted the children of Israel to get saved. He even said in Romans chapter 9, and when you get there, look at verse 2 that he was willing to put his own salvation on the line. He said he wished himself to be accursed so that his kinsmen could be saved. It says in Romans 9, chapter number, uh, verse number 2, Romans 9, 2, it says, that I, have a great that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I, w I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises who are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. So Paul is saying in this passage that he wished that or he, he wished himself a curse for of, of Christ, meaning that he wished that he can be unsaved. That so that his fellow brother, meaning the brother of the his, his brethren of the flesh, the children of Israel, this is going to have to be put on the floor. <laughs> but the children of Israel, that they can get saved. But you know what? It doesn't work that way. You don't. Paul can't get saved for the children of Israel, and they can't get saved for him. You get saved on your own. It's something that's an individual decision that you have to make on your own, whether or not you're going to put your trust and faith in Christ. Same goes with your family, is that they have to make that decision to put their trust and faith in Christ. The Bible says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For, uh, the right, or, for Christ is the end of righteousness to everyone, of the law to everyone that believeth. The only way you can escape that judgment of hell is when you believe on Christ. And that's how the end of the righteousness uh, of the law comes, is that God, the only righteousness that you can have imputed on yourself is the righteousness of Christ. So just hanging out with the right people isn't going to ensure your salvation. That's why when people say this at the door, oh yeah, I know I'm going to heaven because my, my dad's a pastor. You know, the person's saying something that's just totally ridiculous, you know. And a lot of the time when they say that, they're just not saved. I mean, it's just that simple. And they're just trying to get you away. Because uh, half the time when I talk to people like that, I can't even, once they tell me that, they don't want to listen to the gospel anymore. So... That's something I just want to bring up is that salvation is an individual decision. And just because you hang out with the right people doesn't mean that you're just automatically saved. God's going to just say, come in, my good and faithful servant. And same thing, just because you hang around the right people, you're not going to automatically get God's blessings on your life. The, the way to get God's blessings on your life is keeping God's commandments. It's being obedient to his word. It's fearing God. But that's something that you have to do on an individual basis. Now, my next point is this. Go with me to 1 Samuel chapter number 4. 1 Samuel chapter number 4. So we see my first point is just because you're hanging around the right people doesn't automatically mean that you're saved. Micah, th or Micah thought that he would have God's blessing just because he had a Levite to a priest. Just because he had someone spiritual around him, therefore 
God's going to bless them. But that's not true. Just because you're around spiritual people and you're wi living a wicked life, that doesn't mean anything. God's not going to bless you wicked, living a wicked life just because you're around the right person. But my second point is this, is, is this, is that just having spiritual objects doesn't mean God's blessings are on your life. Now, the reason I had you turn to 1 Samuel chapter number 4 is that this is the story about the children of Israel fighting against the Philippi Philistines. And if you look at verse 1, it says, And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines pitched in Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel, and when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. So what's going on is that the children of Israel are fighting with the Philistines, and the Philistines are winning. They, have, they, they ended up uh, killing about 4,000 men of the children of Israel. Well, look at verse 3. It says, And when the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Look at this. It says, Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it, come among, when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hands of our enemies. So what are these people trusting in? They're thinking that, well, we're losing this battle now. Maybe if we go and fetch the Ark of the Covenant of God and bring it to the camp, bring it to the battle where we're at, then that's going to save us from our enemies. Well, let's see what happens. It says, so the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring forth bring from thence the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, which dwells between the cherubims and the sons of Eli, Hophni, Phineas, and Eli, sorry, the sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phineas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. So they bring, they end up bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the camp. They start yelling as loud as they can thinking that this is going to be what helps them win the battle. So they think, well, we have this, the Ark of the Covenant. And look, the Ark of the Covenant is a spiritual object. I mean, it, it, had, I mean, it was so holy that only Levites could touch it. And if you read later on in other chapters that people were looking into the Ark of the Covenant and they were dying. I think it was like 50,000 people ended up dying just because they peeked and saw the Ark of the Covenant. So this is a spiritual object. It's a powerful, something that has the power of God upon it. And these people are shouting, and the earth is ringing, and they think they're going to win this battle. But let's see what happens in verse 6. It says, And when the Philistines heard, that, heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth, meaneth the noise of, the, of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was come into the camp. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. Woe unto us, we shall deliver, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong and quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. So the Hebrew or the Philistines end up seeing this. They hear the great shout. The earth is ringing just because of how loud they, sh they, they were shouting the children of Israel. And they're getting scared. They're like, what's going to happen here? You know, is this the same God that ended up putting all the plagues on the Egyptians? So they said, you know what? We're just going to still fight these guys anyway. And they end up fighting them. And if you look at verse 10, it says, And the Philistines fought. And Israel was smitten, and they fled every man to, into his tent, and there was a great slaughter, for there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. And the ark of, the, of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army, and came to Shiloh that's the same day, with his clothes rent, and with earth upon his head." So they're making this big show. They're shouting. They have the Ark of the Covenant in their presence. And what ends up happening ultimately? They still lose the battle. The Philistines end up killing 30,000 of the children of Israel. So what's going on? They have this, this, the Ark of the Covenant. They have a spiritual object, 
something that has power, but they're still losing a battle. Well, you want to know what's going on? Is the children of Israel weren't right with God in this chapter. They were in sin. They had bad priests, Hophni and Phinehas, and other. They were doing a lot of bad things. And God, just because they had that spiritual object with them, didn't mean God's blessing was upon them. And that's why they ended up losing that battle. And oftentimes Christians... Or people will think, well, if I have such and such, then, you know, if I have this prayer shawl, then God's going to, you know, help me in this aspect of my life. Well, if you're living in sin, that's not going to happen. And on top of that, that prayer shawl does nothing. I mean, it does zero for you. It's just some superstitious object that people have. But God's glory departed from the children of Israel, not because the Ark of the Covenant didn't have power. It's because the people were in sin. And if you're in sin then no matter what spiritual object you have, it's not going to help you. And I don't believe any of those spiritual objects even mean anything. And I'm going to go over a few that you're probably familiar with. Like, for instance, if you go into a Catholic church, what are you going to see? You're going to see statues of saints. And what do they often do in a Catholic church? They end up praying to these statues of saints. I remember in the Philippines one day, we went... We ended up going soul winning in like a Catholic church, and then we ended up winning people with Christ in a Catholic church. So I was with a guy named Kenton, and we're like just kind of like walking around. I'm like, look at this statue, and then like I accidentally touched one, and that thing almost fell. I was like, oh crap! <laughs> so I ended up having to run out because we thought we were going to destroy the Catholic statue. But these people think that well, we have these statues of the saints. We're going to pray to these statues, and what ultimately do they think? Well. When we pray to these statues of the saints, then we're going to get God's blessings on our life. I've talked to Catholics about that, and they say, oh, when I pray, I pray out to the saints, and these saints are going to bless me. That's what, why I pray out to the saints, is so that I can receive their blessings. No, that's not true. And on top of that, these statues that they have of all these saints, it's idolatry. You're worshiping some saint that you don't even know how he looked and making a statue of it. That's not needed. I don't believe Christians should have statues like that. Same with engraving. They have like engraved things with saints' faces and other things. And they do the same thing with that where they pray. And it's just another form of idolatry because you shouldn't be praying to some saint. You know who you should be praying to? God. Because God's going to be the one who answers your prayers. God's going to be the one who ends up uh, giving you the blessings that you need. Another thing is crucifix. That's something I see on Catholics a lot, where they'll have crosses of everything. So they have crosses around their neck, and then when something goes bad, you know, they do that garbage or whatever, or they'll kiss the crucifix. Well, that's another form of idolatry, because what do they think? They think, oh, well, this symbol of the cross is going to ensure blessings upon my life. It's going to ward off evil, because what, when they usually do that garbage, it's whenever they think something bad is going to happen. So there, or whenever something bad happens in their life, then they do this thinking that that's just going to fix everything. No, if you're living in sin, just doing this isn't going to fix anything. And they think, and a lot of Christians, they'll carry like necklaces with crosses. And look, I'm not against the cross. That's what we look to for salvation. But I don't look to that for blessings and to, to ward off spirits or ward off troubles in my life. The crucifix is just there. You know, it's something that we look symbolically about Jesus' death and him dying for our sins, not something that we use to protect us from bad things happening in our lives. And the last one I think of, another Catholic spiritual item, is a rosary bead. And you probably see people with rosary beads where, same thing, whenever something bad happens, they say do you know 50 Hail Marys and then count it on a rosary bead. So they think that these rosary beads ensure some blessing upon their life or it's going to fix some problem that they have. And what is a rosary bead ultimately? It's a sin against God because what are these people doing? They're doing vain repetition. They're just constantly saying the same prayer over and over and over and over again. And you know what God does? He doesn't listen to those prayers at all because vain repetitious prayers, God doesn't answer those because it, he clearly says that against, or he clearly preaches against those in Matthew chapter number six. So the Catholics have it all wrong. And where I believe a lot of the stuff that they have all these objects, these spiritual objects that they have or that they use, I believe a lot of that just comes from the paganism that they had back in the day. And they just added it to their religion. Because I know the story goes, you know, going back to the crucifix, with Constantine that he was in some battle with some, uh, some army or whatever, and he ended up having a dream or something along those lines. I, the stories mix when you get different sources, but he, had a, he ended up having a dream and he saw a picture of a cross in the dream. Therefore, he ended up getting the cross and putting it on all the, the army's shields and armor and different things like that, thinking that that, and 
when he did that, that ended up helping them win the battle. That's what he thought. But it's just like a cause and effect, or it's one of those kind of uh, fallacies where, well, there I put this cross on my shield and on my weapons, therefore we won the battle. No, because Constantine wasn't a good guy, and whoever he was fighting probably wasn't, you know, godly. They weren't godly people. So anyone who won that battle, it wouldn't have mattered. They would have given glory to whatever. You know, say if he was fighting the which I know they probably weren't dur during that time. Let's just say he was fighting some Muslims, right? If he was fighting Muslims and they won that battle, what are they going to say? Oh, glory to Allah, right? Well, in that, the end, if it's one wicked person going against another wicked person and one of the wicked people wins, it doesn't matter. You know, and anything that they see or think that helped them win that battle, they're going to glorify that. And I think that's where at least the Catholic Church gets the crosses from, why they worship crosses so much, is because of that story. They think that Constantine, because he won that battle with the cross and putting the cross on everything, that's, that's why the cross has this power, this great power. No, the great power of the cross is to get you saved. It's something that you can look back to and know that Jesus Christ died for your sin. But just putting crosses on everything doesn't save you and it doesn't ward off any bad or trouble in your life now that's for from the catholic side but christians do the same thing in the sense of i'll just say non non-saved christians or like pentecostals because i don't know if anyone if you remember as a kid or any of you who may have watched tv and you'll see all of the pentecostal uh um like infomercials so you'll see the prayer shawls or the, the miracle water, and I'm going to go over that in a second. But it's from all these weird Pentecostals like Ken Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, uh, Peter Popoff. And I tried to find it. It seems like a lot of those are gone now. But I remember back in like the early 2000s, the late 90s, you would see a lot of those infomercials come up. And I was just trying to at least see some of the objects they had or some of the garbage so I could preach against it. But I couldn't find any in the time I looked to prepare the sermon. So I'm sorry about that. But something that I can think of is this, is that you have some weird Christian merch. I don't know if anyone knows what merch is, but it's merchandise. That's what these YouTubers say. They call it now. They call it merch. But there's a lot of weird Christian things that's not really needed, and people think it's going to bring these blessings on their life, but it doesn't. Now, nothing's wrong with having a shirt that says Christ or some other thing. I, don't, I mean, you know, or a watch or any of those things. But it's just like people can take those, those things that are o overboard. Another thing I noticed in my life just going to different churches is that they'll have this thing called anointing oil. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, if, especially if you've been to like a Pentecostal church. Well, what they'll do with the anointing oil, the quote-unquote anointing oil, is that they will put it on everything. And they would say, well, we're going to bless that you, you move into a new house. And what do they do? They put a cross over the, every door and say, this is what's going to bring God's blessings into your house. And it's going to ward off any, any evil. Which, no. <laughs> it's just that simple. Just because you're putting oil on the door, you know what you're doing? Ultimately, you're just messing up your paint. You're going to have to paint that eventually. So doing that doesn't bring any blessings in your life but a lot of people believe that you go to pentecostal churches and that's the big thing that they have is that we're going to use anointing oil to to ward off all this evil in your life and so on and so forth and then same with prayer shawls you know you can't pray just without your head covered so now you have to buy this prayer shawl that's going to give like extra H, you know, horsepower or whatever to get your, your prayer to God. You know, you don't need a prayer shawl, which I've seen that on websites where people, I guess they wrap themselves in a shawl and pray, and then that's how they think that God's blessing is going to come upon their prayer. That doesn't happen either. I mean, it's, it's all gimmicks, and it's all a bunch of uh, just, it's a, a bunch of false prophets and charlatans trying to sell you stuff, making merchandise of people of God, or people who are just gullible where they think those type of things work. Now, I brought up Miracle Water because I did go on Peter Popoff's website, and Peter Popoff, I mean, that already sounds like a false prophet. I mean, <laughs> the last name Popoff, you know, it's just like, come on. Well, Peter Popoff Ministries offers a packet of Miracle Spring Water to any caller interested. Those who have used the water claim it has changed their lives. Some received thousands of dollars after using the water. Others gained assets such as homes or cars and all, and all encourage you to try it for yourself. So on Peter Popoff's website, he's selling this miracle water. And I don't know where he gets this miracle water. I believe he probably gets it from Satan. You know, Satan pours it out in cups so he can go sell it to, to gullible people. But he has this miracle water that he is trying to say that, and I've seen the commercials where they say, well, I drank this miracle water and I was in $50,000 of debt. 
and now it's all gotten wiped out. Or I drink, drank this miracle water and I just got a $4,000 check in the mail. It's like, come on. <laughs> I mean, it's like ridiculous. But this is what these charlatans do. They're trying to have these inf infomercials to say, yeah, you should buy these products because they're going to bring God's blessing on your life. You know, you're late on your bills. You're late on your mortgage. Just drink some of this miracle water. Sprinkle some of this miracle water around your house and God's blessing is going to be all over it. Now it says this, this is directly from his website where it says the miracle spring water is a powerful biblical point of contact. So he says this, this miracle water is biblical and it's a point of contact. So I've read the Bible cover to cover many times and I've never seen the miracle spring water in any chapter or any book. But it says there is nothing magical or mystical about it. The Bible uses points of contact in numerous locations to release miracles. And he gives a scripture from Acts chapter number 11. If you want, you can turn, or sorry, not Acts chapter number 11, Acts chapter, chapter number 19. And if you look at verse 11, this is the scripture that they use to prove their point of why you should buy or why you should get this miracle uh, spring water because it's going to change your life because it says this so many people have used miracle spring water and their lives have been changed let me send you this miracle spring water so his this is his text verse for why miracle spring water is going to work and bring this blessings on your life look at verse 11 it says and God wrought special miracles by the hand of Paul so that from his body were brought unto the sick, handkerchiefs and aprons and, disease, and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. So this is this text verse to prove that if you buy or if you get this miracle water from his website, that everything's going to be fine. And what he means by point of contact is this, is that if you read here in verse 12 in Acts chapter number 19, that uh, Paul, he would have a handkerchief and people would take the handkerchief and the aprons and they will touch other people. Or, you know, people would be touched by it and whatever disease they had would be gone or if they had any real spirits, it would depart from them. So he was, he, what he's saying is that, well, the miracle of spring water is a point of contact. And what that means is that just like how these handkerchiefs did miracles to remove diseases and evil spirits from people, well, that's the same thing that this water does. Well, first of all, I don't see water mentioned in this passage at all. <laughs> and then not only that, if you look back at verse 11, it says this, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. These are special miracles that were only performed by Paul and God's disciples, God or Jesus' disciples. He gave them special power to do special miracles for a special certain period of time that we can't do nowadays. That's why we don't sit there, you know, if, if these faith healers and charlatans like this guy, uh, if everything he's saying is true, why doesn't he just go around and give everyone who has the coronavirus some of this miracle water? He doesn't do that because he knows it doesn't work. Same with if these faith healers are really as faith healer or as true as they say they are, why don't they just go and start walking around the streets and touching everyone on the head and healing all these people, you know, that have the coronavirus or that, that uh, have other diseases? They don't do that. You know, they just want you to buy their products or their garbage off of their websites and then use that so they can make merchandise of you. Now, it says this. Last thing I'll bring up. It says the anointing of God is transferable and can be imparted from one person to another. And this is made evident as the power of God that worked through Paul was transmitted through prayer cloths, which... No, <laughs> let's just leave it as that. So the guy is just trying to make merchandise of people use. He's just trying to use Bible or verses out of context to try to sell his dumb product. Now, those are just things that a lot of unsafe people are going to use. And a lot of unsafe people are going to bring up. But I do want to bring up one that I think a lot of pe Christians will say is a lucky charm. And a lot of people who even save kind of get up caught up in that trap to so this 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 trap of that the Bible is a lucky charm. And a lot of people think that, now look, the Bible, I love the Bible, the Bible's awesome. I mean, my faith is in the things written in the Bible, but this paper Bible, the, copy, the, the book, isn't some spiritual thing that wards off devils or demons. You know, I don't put my Bible under my pillow at night so that I can have sweet dreams. I don't 
put a New Testament in my pocket so no one will harm me or no one will beat me up. You know, that's not the Bible doesn't do those things. You know, it's not just this thing of protection that you you need in your life. And what I want you to do is go to Jeremiah chapter number 51, Jeremiah 51. Now, like I said, I love the Bible, but just the Bible itself, just these black pages and, you know, or sorry, these black words and white pages, it's not this spiritual thing that's just going to protect me from everything in my life. No, the Bible is just there so we can have something to read God's Word. This is how God reveals His Word to us is through the Bible. Now, the reason I bring this up, I remember being at a funeral, and this guy, like, I, I, someone wanted to take a picture, and I had a Bible in my hand. So you know what I did? I put the Bible on the floor. This guy, and then I, after we took the picture, I picked it up. And this, because I was young, I was probably like maybe 17 or so. So I put the Bible on the floor, picked it up, and then this guy chewed me out. He was just like, why did you put this bi the Bible on the floor? You know that's wrong. You should never let a Bible touch the ground. That's the worst thing you can ever do. I'm just like, what's going on with this guy? Well, a lot of people, for some reason, I guess they're, they're like Republicans. You know when you drop a flag on the floor and then they say you have to burn it? Well, they, they, they feel the same way like with the Bible, that if you drop a Bible on the floor, then it's just taboo. You can't do that. It's not that big of a deal, you know. And another thing is that Christians, they don't like to, you know, say they have a Bible. They've been using it. That thing is worn down. The cover's missing. All the pages are just all over the place. Pages are missing from it. And then for some weird reason, they don't want to throw it away. You know, it's not wrong to throw away a Bible. But people are like, oh, well, it's the King James Bible. It's not wrong to throw away a worn, used King James Bible. People are like, oh. No, it's not wrong. You can throw away a Bible. It's not that big of a deal because it's not the actual paper copy of the Bible that we, you know, that's spiritual. It's the words that are inside of the Bible. So that's the thing. People have to understand that it's not just the, the words. I mean, it's not just the paper copy of the Bible that you need. It's the words that come out of it. And a lot of these people who are superstitious about the Bible, they don't want to, they don't read the Bible, but then they have it all over the place thinking it's just going to ward off all this evil in their life. And that's not necessarily true. Now, I had you turn to Je Jeremiah chapter number 51, because let's see what Jeremiah does with the Word of God. I mean, he, he wrote part of this book, you know, of Jeremiah, and he, he ended up doing something after he wrote, you know, Jeremiah 51 and 50 and 51. It says in verse 62 of Jeremiah 51, Then shalt thou say, O Lord, thou hast spoken against this place to cut it off, that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but that it shall be desolate forever. And he's talking about the judgment of Babylon. That's a whole other sermon in and of itself. But then it says in verse 63, And it shall be when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt bind a stone to it and cast it in the midst of Euphrates. In Euph uh, sorry, in the, into the midst of Euphrates. And thou shalt say, Thus shall Babylon sink and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. So what Jeremiah ultimately does, he writes this part of Jeremiah, and he ends up crumpling it up, putting it in a stone, and God tells him to throw it inside the water once he's done, and it's symbolizing what's going to happen to Babylon that's going to sink and it's not going to come back up. Well, people would freak out if you did that with the Bible. You know, if you just finish reading a Bible, the thing's worn down, and that you just throw it away. A lot of people will freak out about that, but nothing's wrong about throwing away a Bible. If you have worn out Bibles, because I, I can understand some people have sentimental values. Maybe it's the first Bible you read cover to cover, and you don't want to throw it away, or you this the first person you wanted to Christ was from this Bible, but it's not that big of a deal to throw away a Bible. And I'll, I'm, I'll even say this. Let me confess my sins. I know everyone's like, oh, what's sin? I was like that. I mean, where I just didn't think, I, I would just hoard Bibles that were like totally torn up. That I got from Dollar Tree just because I was so scared that, well, I don't feel like throwing this away because I think it's wrong. It's not wrong to throw away a worn out Bible. You know, it's not, just you have to understand, it's not the paper copy of the Bible that you're throwing. I mean, it's just the paper copy of the Bible that you're throwing away. It's not the Word of God. There are many other Bibles out there that you can use and that you can get the Word of God. So let's not be superstitious and things like that. Let's not let 
items in our life make us think that we're, we're going to get God's blessings or we're going to be more spiritual if we have it or keep it. Our goal is just to be normal. You know, we don't need any of these things. And a lot of Christians get this stuff where they have all these items that they think are going to bring God's blessing on their life. They're getting it from the Catholics. It's ultimately where you're getting things like that from. You know, nothing's wrong with having a pen that you like or, you know, a book that you want to read. That's fine, but don't sit there and try to think that, oh, there's some spiritual value when I have this item, that this, this item is going to protect me from just danger and other things in my life. No, these things can be thrown away. You don't really, you know, and get a new one. It's that simple. Now, <clears throat> all that to say this is that we as Christians don't need to have this weird mentality that we need all these objects in our lives to be able to get God's blessing. You know, we don't need to think that we need to just have to, to hang around or have this special person in our life that's going to ensure God's blessing. You know, you know how God's blessings come upon your life? You know, the saying goes, the pathway to God's blessing is through what? The door of obedience. The way you're going to get God's blessing upon your life isn't because you have your special partner next to you at all times. is isn't because you have a Levite and you're living in sin. The way you're going to get God's blessing in your life is by keeping God's commandments. It's by serving God. It's by being obedient to His Word. And not only that, it's by fearing God. You know, uh, Solomon says in the book of Ecclesiastes, he says in ver uh, chapter number 12, he says this is the whole duty of man, to, to fear God and to keep his commandments. And that's what's going to help ensure blessings on your life, is when you're serving God, when you're, 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 you're fearing God, and then God will see those things, and he'll be able to, to, to help you in your life. You know, through prayer and just through different things, God will be able to help you with your needs in, in your life. Now, we sing a song often, and I don't know if you noticed this in the song, but it's called, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. And it says this in the first verse, My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall plead. And if you notice that, it says, My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. So what is it saying? It's pretty much saying my whole sermon in a nutshell is that my faith isn't based on some device. It's not based on a creed. You know what it's based on? The, to trust the ever living one who is Jesus Christ. His wounds for me shall plead. So let's just think about that. Let's not get caught up in like, you know, all the gimmicks and, and, and things that people have out there to try to make, uh, to try to spiritualize things that just don't need to be spiritualized. You know, bracelets and, and crosses and things. Let's just be normal people that serve God in a normal capacity and, and not worry about things like that, thinking that these objects in our lives are going to bring blessings, extra blessings to us because we have that. Let's just be normal people that serve God in the, the capacity we can and serve God with fear and through obedience, and God will bless our lives. That's how you're going to find the blessings, not through some weird device or something you buy off of the Benny Hinn Ministries website or Peter Popoff's Miracle Water. You know, you're going to get the blessing of God through the obedience that you do of God's Word. Let's pray.